This video is the second part of a two-part series. So if you haven't checked out the first video, I recommend you do. Today we're going to be going over three things that you need in your breeding business that's either going to make or it's going to break your kettle. If you looked at Power 305 and Fireball and you like them as, say, a stud for your female, don't jump to any conclusions. You still have another two years. Go ahead and find yourself four other males in four different yards uh, so that you're able to compare them to. Now, I already know what you're thinking. You're like, man, this guy's got to be crazy. And no, I'm not crazy, and I'm not afraid of a load of competition, but the fact of the matter is I'd be lying to you if I would only tell you to look at our dogs. I want you to go ahead and compare to four other yards with four other studs. I want you to be able to see what they produce, check out their pedigree, make a comparison, find out how, how much we charge for a stud fee, how much do they charge. This way, by the time the two-year mark rolls around, you're really gonna have an idea as to who you really wanna use. Do yourself another favor. As you see all these five dogs producing, try to find a particular flaw that is prevalent in their production because this is gonna tell you what's gonna happen when they go into your female. So say your female, I don't know, sees east-west up front, and any one of these males decides to start producing east-west, or that's a prevalent flaw that they're producing, obviously you will eliminate them by a process of elimination because that's a particular flaw that you don't wanna double up on. And the same could be true for stiff stifles, underbites, high rear, whatever. Marketing. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, what should I be looking at as far as marketing? Fam, I'm gonna tell you right now, um, a lot of you that are starting out, if you're gonna be breeding, going the female route, it's gonna be two years before your female's fully mature to, to breed or close to it. Um, go ahead and say her story. Uh, you know, before it's lunchtime, make sure you drop a post. When you get off of work, you need to drop a post. You need to be doing this every day and minimum every other day. You also wanna be doing it in at least more than one platform. Don't stay just in Facebook, go to Instagram, try and migrate. Go ahead and throw it out there, whether you're doing a reel. Reels actually do very well. They give people a lot of insight uh, in telling your dog's story. Uh, whether it's pictures, whether it's videos, it doesn't matter. Just make sure it gets out there. The last thing you wanna do is, when that two year mark comes up or when she's ready to breed, you go ahead and breed her and you have to ride or you try and ride that breeder's coattail. You're gonna see that not many breeders want you to just show up, pay for the stud fee, and because of that stud fee, it now means you get to ride their coattail. That's not necessarily how it works. You know, you're not gonna be able to get where that breeder is at the two year mark, you know, especially if they've been breeding for so much longer than you. But you do want to be able to bring something to the table. You don't want to be in a position where, you know, you, you have no marketing whatsoever and therefore you either got to pay for marketing or you put yourself in a position where it's kind of volatile. I've seen far too many times uh, new breeders actually go ahead and breed to a big name dog because they don't have the marketing. Fam, marketing really isn't that hard. It is a process. You must understand as a process, like, I don't know, running a marathon is a process. You know, you start out at zero miles and you work your way up to 26.1 miles. There's no way and there's no magic potion out there that's gonna get you from the start line to the finish line. I mean, that's why I keep telling you guys, you need to produce good dogs, you need to be on top of your marketing. That's all staying in your lane. Do your homework. Don't just right. follow a dog because of the height, fam. Follow it because you know it's gonna make your yard better, because the structure is there, because what your female needs is actually what he's gonna complement, and vice versa. Whether you're learning the relationship between the K allele, where you have KB, which is gonna give you black, KBR, which is gonna give you brindle, or KY, which is gonna allow anything that's in the A allele to show in particular tan points for those of you that want to produce tri. Now I just gave you a little nugget. Now there's a lot more to that as far as genetics is concerned, things that are more important like health testing, knowing what CRD4, knowing that you don't breed dogs that carry ataxia, things like that. Uh, it's really important because in the long run of your program, those are the things that are actually gonna bring it down. Oh yes, and let me not forget temperament. These are things that are really, really important that you're looking at before you get into 
breeding to a particular dog. This is why those two years that you're letting your female mature are going to be vital for your program and you're already going to know who you're going to be breeding to. So we are aware that males actually mature by the time they're 12 months old. So being able to breed him outside to females, um, a lot of times people ask for money, but when you're starting out, in my opinion, it's usually a pretty good idea to get a pup back, particularly first pick. If you want to build your kennel up, you could actually get, say, a couple of first pick females. That's actually going to help your kennel grow without you having to stick your hand in your pocket. Now, breeding male strategies are going to be a lot like the female breeding strategy. You want to make sure that you're breeding to females that don't carry a particular flaw that maybe your male has. You want a female that's actually going to correct it. The same strategy that you're going to be using with studs, where you're going to be seeing, say, a stud from here and four other studs. You do the same with other kennels and their females. Those females are going to tell you what that program is all about. Typically, the females are the lifeblood of the program. As you know, and I've explained here before, the female is the only one that's going to pass the mitochondrial DNA. So that body you're seeing on your male, yeah, that whole information came straight from mom. It's not passed through the dad. And regardless if you started with a male or a female, and regardless what your philosophy and your concept is, you always want to test your philosophy and concept. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to marry the first thing that comes your way as far as a new philosophy. What it means is you're going to put your philosophy to test. So say, for example, you start looking at males that are inbred with their daughters and you see a particular trend or pattern, yet you see a male bred to his mother and you're seeing a better trait or pattern then these are things that you want to take a note of that might change a little bit the way that you're thinking because now you may want to place more value on a son to mother breeding over a father to daughter again we go back to the mitochondrial dna i just talked about and you may see the reasoning behind it but don't just take my word for it actually sit there and see why the breeders are doing what open up the pedigree go back see why it is that you know such and such bred this to that and try to follow it along that way that way by the time you see a breeding program actually make a decision as to why they're going to breed a male to a female you're already going to have a leg up and having a leg up is what's actually going to get your program going in the right direction when it's time to pick pups out of any one of these kennels or using their studs all right, that's pretty much it for staying in your lane. I think pretty much covered the marketing, covered the female, the male strategy, also giving you an idea, a little bit about genetics. Now, the next thing is raising your own bar. Raising your own bar really is not going to happen until you start putting productions on the ground. Those are the ones that are going to tell you exactly what it is that your dogs are producing and which way you got to go. Again, make sure you look at breeding as a process. It's not something that you could just look at a dog and make a decision and that's the way it's going to go. There's plenty of times you're going to see a dog that's going to show something and it's going to totally fake you out when it's time to produce for good or for bad. Again, if you've been doing your homework on our kennel and for other kennels that we've talked about, you're going to have a conceptual idea as to what type of genetics each kennel brings. Also, what type of genetics a particular female has based on whether it has been inbred has been line bred or it has been outcrossed. I know a lot of you take a look at color and I could tell you right now, color is definitely part of the equation, but it cannot be the sole thing. But it doesn't hurt to know a little bit about color genetics while you're health testing and making sure that your dog is healthy. Raising your own bar also means being able to be objective with your yard. Compare your yard once you start producing to these other kennels that you've been looking at, whose history you've learned, whose pedigree you know, because that gives you a basis as to where you can compare. Know coming into this that irregardless how much money you spent on a particular pup, whether it's a male or a female or both, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna make the cut or they're gonna make the program. Too many times I've seen young breeders base themselves exclusively as to how much they paid for a dog and how that dog is now pressured into becoming whether a stud in their yard or be a female that's actually a foundation female. I'm gonna tell you right now, 
what you need to know and not necessarily what you want to hear. And that is when your female produces her first and second litter and when your stud produces his first and second litter, you are already going to be having a pretty good idea as to whether they are producers or not. You're going to start seeing if they are producers structure beyond what they were when they were pups. The same could be true the other way around. You could have a dog that's very well structured ever since he was a pup. However, once he produces, you start seeing some funky things like a high rear that was never there. You start seeing displacic elbows. Uh, you start seeing east-west that he nor the female had. And this starts giving you an inkling as to where your dog actually stands as far as production. If you've been looking at these other dogs and all of these kennels, including ours, you're gonna have an idea where your dog stands. The other part of raising your game is patience. Um, this game, a lot of times, creates pressure. And when people feel pressure, they immediately wanna jump and make a decision. It usually happens when you're really starting out early in this game. You pretty much hear the hype, you see the dogs, and you just wanna dive in. Not saying that that's bad. I'm sure it's happened to many of us, myself included. But with that being said, you come into this knowing that this is a patience game. That dog that you rush into, sooner than later, you're gonna to have to see him or her produce so you can have an idea as to whether they're gonna be foundation to your yard. And be open-minded and objective enough that if they're not, you're able to move on from them. A the third part to this is kinda of like miscellaneous, if you will, but it's also very important. Now, for the last two years that you've been either growing your female or your male or whatnot, uh, I'm pretty sure when you go into either Facebook post or even check out your Instagram followers or whatever your feed page comes up, you're going to see that there's people that actually do services that have everything to do with breeding, such as transportation, an air nanny, or whether it's ground transportation, these types of things. While your dog is developing and becoming mature, now's the time to make those connections. Try to have three, four, or five transporters, you know, a couple of air nannies, only because sometimes you may have a transporter that transports coast to coast. You may need a dog in New York, but he's currently all the way in California, and you may need to call somebody else in order to expedite the move of your dog because when a customer buys from you, you owe yourself that service to that customer that actually came and bought, put his money in your brand. Being involved in the community, whether it's a fundraiser or simply just sharing awareness. If you go into a group and somebody's asking for something that you may have found the answer to every or anywhere, just go ahead and share it, man. Breeding is not about keeping anything a secret. The fact that you feel you know something, you feel you're gonna keep it secret, sooner or later it's gonna to come to light. And when it does, so will your ambivalence or your position of not wanting to share at that time. So just keep that in mind. Lastly, and certainly not least, adding value to what you currently have, whether it's showing your dog, whether it's having your dog pull, whether it is getting your dog a good citizen certification, whatever the case may be, adding value to your dog as it gets to the point of maturity is only gonna raise its value by the time you get there. Also, getting yourself a vet is really important. Last thing you want is to have your female pregnant and you don't have a vet and she's close to giving birth. You wanna make sure you have multiple vets, not just one. Keep in mind, vets are human beings too. Some of them don't like to work late hours. In other words, they won't do on call. You may need one that does on call and one that does just your regular checkups. So you make sure you get yourself a vet. It's always important. Fam, lastly, I'm gonna tell you this. You need to invest in your program. You don't wanna have a dog down on dirt, on a chain, tied to a tree. That's like, what kind of life is that dog living? Fam, I cannot iterate enough how much it is important for you to put money into your facilities. But you gotta make sure that they're living a good life, that they're being taken care of, that they're actually going to the vet, and they actually have adequate facilities. 